Hi guys, I'm Caitlin Albritton. I'm a painter turned silversmith who uses inlay to make wearable paintings for my jewelry company, C. Albritton Designs. Ever since I learned about inlay, I thought it was like the perfect way to make literally paintings that could jump off the wall and be worn down the street. And it's just so ripe and awesome for delicious image making. I'm most well known for my figurative pillow inlays of expressive women who exude all their emotions through body language. With their abstracted, kind of exaggerated body expressions, I'm aiming for a kind of mix of playful, elegant, and then maybe even a little touch of the absurd in my work. If you're interested in seeing more of my artwork, check out my website. I'll have a link in the description below. Now today we're not gonna go that crazy with all the elaborate designs. We're gonna be focusing on how to make a simple flush cut inlay. Now what is inlay exactly? What we're doing is we're gonna make a silver or a sterling silver framework, and then we're gonna be cutting the stones to fit exactly into those slots or channels. Maybe it's also called channel inlay. You might've heard that term. Um, you may have also heard of the term intarsia, and there's a little slight differences between inlay and intarsia. Intarsia is also image making or design making with small little bits of stone, but you're doing that as a capstone and then all the silversmithing comes after the fact. Um, so those are the differences between that. Now today, if you're looking to give this tutorial a whirl, I recommend having some experience in both silversmithing and lapidary work. So silversmithing, just your basics, sawing, soldering, all that good stuff. For lapidary, you want to know how to make a cabochon. You won't necessarily need to learn calibration. Like if you're feeling like really gung-ho and you want to go for it, I'd say go for it. Um, calibration will certainly help you if you've already had that background. So this tutorial isn't like three hours long because I take my time. I think usually the pen it takes maybe about two hours, but I take my time so you can I get things right along the way. I've actually fast forwarded some of the sections in my video for, you know, to a comfortable watching pace. And then so you don't also feel like you're like watching paint dry as well, because <laughs> it can feel like that. I've also split up the video into two parts. So I have part one, which will focus on all just the silversmithing work. And then part two, we'll go over just all the lapidary stuff. Also, um, in the description below, you'll find um, a written list of all the materials you'll need for everything, and then also some links of where to find them if you're struggling and where to find them. With that in mind, let's get right down to it. So here's some of the things you'll need for the silversmithing portion of your inlay. Transparent tracing paper, some silver strip wire, and your choice of size, but mine is 1 8 inch tall and 24 gauge. A backplate of your choosing, once again, that 24 gauge. For my bale, I'm using a double half round wire, which is 4.12 by 1.02 millimeters. And you might decide to just do a different design altogether. Then you'll need some hard and medium solder, applique pins bent at the top to make an upside down L. And they do get kind of charred from repeated firings, as you can see mine in the picture, but I try to make most of their lifespan. Then you'll need a medium duty fire brick, and this is not too hard that you can't stick those applique pins in to hold your uh, silver strip wire in place, but not too soft that they don't stay put. Then you need a spray bottle of Prips Flux that I make, and I'll be working on a tutorial for that soon, as well as some silversmithing basic tools like a torch, files, saw, flex shaft for sanding, some polishing compounds, and maybe some other miscellaneous things you might have in lying around the studio. For your first inlay, you want to choose a simple design like a square or rectangle since straight edges are going to be easier to cut than any kind of organic or curved shape for now. I chose a rectangle and I actually just googled some pictures of rectangles, then held my transfer paper right up to the screen to get my template. You could also bend wire around a jig or some other shape if you have some other size you want for your pendant. Use a little bit of tape to hold your template down while you bend your wire. I cut a length of my wire and have decided where I want the seam of my pendant to be, which will be at the bottom center. I'll align the wire against the design, then use a pencil to mark where I want to make a bend for a corner. Grab the wire just a little before the pencil mark with some chain nose pliers, and then bend it. Get the wire as close as you can to the template, but you can always do some minor adjustments to straighten it up after you solder. 
this part of inlay just takes some time playing with the wire to get used to where you need to position your pliers to get the curves you want in your inlays, especially if you want to do some different designs other than, you know, uh, geometrical shapes. Once you get to the end, you'll cut your strip wire and file your ends flat, just like you would any other bezel. You might have to fiddle with the ends a bit just to make sure they're all aligned nicely. Now this part is optional for an easy design like this, but I like to use those applique pins to hold my design along the paper template. I'll position some on the inside and then some on the outside of the wires to hold it all in place while I solder. When I come over to solder, I spray my joints with Prips Flux, and then I have a little bit of hard solder that I ball up with heat, pick up with my pick solder, and then dab it on my join. Once it flows, you can take out your applique pins while it cools and then go ahead and quench and pickle the piece. Once it's out of the pickle pot, I'm taking my pliers again to make any minor adjustments to make the sides a little more even. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, and actually you'll never get it completely perfect, but the good news is that you won't even notice that once the stones are inlaid and it's being worn. Now I'll start marking out how much I'll need for a back plate and cut it out with shears since it's thin gauge and I'm a little too lazy to saw it out. Off screen, I pattern and stamp my insignia on the back since who doesn't like a little pizzazz on their jewelry? But now, as you can see, the back plate and sidewalls on my inlay aren't flush and there's a big gap between the two pieces. You can either use a rawhide hammer to flatten that back plate or I like just using my pliers again to bend it back. I'll then hold that rectangular wire against a flat surface to see if there are any gaps, then file the side that's going to be soldered to the back plate since you want a nice close fit. You can even use some binding wire to hold the pieces in place if you need to. At the end, I'll use a green scotch pad to remove any greasy fingerprints from the surface before I go to solder. I'll start by spraying the back side of the back plate with Prips Flux, getting a really nice coat on it to help reduce fire scale as I work. I'll then flip the back plate so I can set up the wire rectangle on top before fluxing all of this as well. Now I already have some lengths of hard solder prepped for me on my solder brick to place on the inside edges of the design. Now that I have all those pieces of solder nicely tucked against the wall and the back plate, I can get that solder flowing in place. Once again, you'll quench and pickle this piece. Next, you'll saw off the excess back plate. Then file the back plate edge flush with the walls. Before I do any more sanding and cleaning up, I'll work on the hidden bail hook on the back side of the piece. I'm using about an inch of double half round wire, which in retrospect was actually a little bit too long, but oh well. Then you can use your chain nose pliers against to bend it to whatever kind of hooky shape you desire. You'll want to file this for a while to make sure you have a nice flat surface to solder onto the back plate. Back at the solder brick, I'll use Prips Flux on all parts of my bail hook and also the back side of the pendant. Now I just eyeball the center line with a permanent marker so I can see what's going on and where I need to align my bail so it doesn't end up getting soldered on all wonky. Once you align your hook, I'm balling up some little chips of medium solder and using the pick solder technique to place them. But you could also just use some small tweezers to place them beforehand and then heating that all to temperature and letting it flow. Then you know the drill, we're gonna go ahead and quench and pickle the whole thing again. Now that we're on the tail end of this part of the project, we're getting into finishing the silver. I like using this 3M wheel to knock down a lot of those rough marks from the filing. As you're doing this, you wanna also make sure to bevel the bottom edge so it's not sharp against the wearer's skin. From here, you can go into whatever sanding process you like best, but here I'm using a tapered split shaft mandrel and 220 grit held down with a little bit of tape so it doesn't go flying everywhere. Now I'll work the whole piece down to 600 grit before tossing it into my tumbler with a stainless steel mix shot for about an hour to give the whole piece an overall more consistent texture. Congrats, you're now done with the silversmithing part of your inlay and left with a really nice framework to let the artistry of your stone cutting shine. If you're wondering about a final polish on the silver, I'll end up doing that after the stones are cut and polished in part two. Once again, make sure to check out the description below for a materials list and links of where to find some of the supplies I'm using. Now, good luck on your project. May the solder fairies guide you to success, and I'll see you back over at part two. Bye, you guys.